13th of January, 1979, Norwich City versus West Bromwich Albion. A 1-1 result that to most would be insignificant. It marks a young Justin Fashnew's professional league debut for Norwich. The new boy involved again. Little did people watching know that this promising young athlete would make history on and off the pitch. Fashnew would become the first gay footballer to play in the English Premier League and the only one to be open with his sexuality during his playing career. He quickly settled into the struggling Canary side as a regular first team player and won the 1980-81 BBC Goal of the Season with a sublime volley from outside the box against Liverpool. Oh, oh, Despite scoring 19 goals that season, joint third top scorer in the league, Norwich were relegated to the second division. Yet it was obvious Fashnu belonged at this level and many teams vied for his services. A fee of £1.13 million from Nottingham Forest was the cost of his signature. With this being the first million plus fee for a black footballer, it was clear to all he was a special talent. The following season should have been one of growth and progression for Justin. Yet once Forest manager Brian Clough became aware of his sexuality, he was quickly and unceremoniously dumped from the first team. This shift in Justin's fortune would unfortunately be the pattern for the rest of his career. An incredible 19 transfers over the next 15 years show not only how he struggled to find a home for his football, but also how he possessed such talent that clubs would still sign him, hoping they could be the place he would be accepted by. To teammates and managers, it was no secret Justin was homosexual. It was somewhat of an open secret to the public too, with his frequent outings to gay bars and clubs being rumoured in the tabloids. It was on the 22nd of October 1990, however, that Justin would openly come out to the wider world through the front page story in The Sun. One million pound soccer star, I am gay. The story was less interested in the struggles of a gay black man in the world of football and would instead focus on the supposed affair he was a part of with an unnamed member of parliament. Justin later admitted that he wasn't fully prepared for the backlash that followed and his career in football suffered heavy damage. Vashnu finished his playing career after the 97-98 season with Miramar Rangers in New Zealand before transitioning to a coaching role at Maryland Mania, a brand new team due to begin playing in the American Second Division, the A-League, in 1999. However, this chance at a second career in football would not last. In March 1998, a 17-year-old boy would report to local Maryland police that the British footballer performed non-consensual sexual acts on him as he awoke after a night of drinking. Not only was Fashnu facing the charges of assault on the minor, he would do so in the state of Maryland, where homosexual acts themselves were illegal at the time, even amongst consenting adults. With such circumstances, Fashnu believed he wouldn't face fair legal proceedings and fled to London before police could obtain a warrant for his arrest. Under the threat of extradition to the US and believing his status as a gay black man would prevent him from having a fair trial, pressure was mounting. On Sunday, May 3rd, 1998, Fashnu's body was found in a Shoreditch lockup by a passing member of the public. He had hung himself. In his suicide note, he denied that the acts were non-consensual and that the 17-year-old had attempted to blackmail him before going to the police. Speaking in regards to the content of his suicide note, the coroner supposed, clearly, he did not wish to cause more pain or more distress to his family or loved ones. Three years after Justin Fashnu's suicide, there is still yet to be another openly homosexual player in any of England's professional top four leagues. In his chapter, 100 Missing Men, Participation, Selection and Silence of Gay Athletes, 
featured in the Routledge Handbook of Sport, Gender and Sexuality. Scott Agawa estimates using crude statistics that of the 3,496 men from the four major North American sports leagues, there should be at least 100 homosexual men. Using the same method, I've estimated there should be approximately 62 homosexual men of the 2,383 currently playing in England's professional leagues. This documentary will look at the potential reasons why these 62 players are invisible. My focus won't be entirely centered on the English men's game, however. Look into the women's game, we may gain a better understanding of how gender and culture causes different approaches to how sexuality is accepted before taking a look internationally, seeing how homosexuality is viewed worldwide in football and what the future looks like for acceptance of queer men in professional football. Justin Fashnu is currently the only openly gay player to have played in the English First Division. And even then, by the time he had openly shared his sexuality with the media and fans, his football career at the top was over. So where are these 62 missing men? Are they missing? Or are they not willing to endure the potential abuse from teammates, managers, media and fans? Things aren't as simple as this, however. Complex situations such as this rarely are. But Scott Gower offers three key hypotheses which can be used to suggest why there are no gay footballers in England's professional leagues. The first is what he calls the silence. Gay men remain silent about their sexuality. In this hypothesis, there are 62 gay men, but due to worries about the effects of coming out, be they in the sporting organisations they compete for or how they are treated by the press and fans. Patrice Evra suggested this might be likely, as in an interview with French newspaper Le Parisien, he claims that at each team he played for, at least two of his teammates were homosexual. Comfortable to be open with him and certain other teammates. I played with players who were gay. Face to face, they opened up with me because they are afraid to speak otherwise. Fashion's tragic story is the most publicised version of how the reaction can be catastrophic to a player's career or his life outside of the sport. Justin's manager at Nottingham Forest, the often revered Brian Clough, referred to him as a bloody puff, and that's just what he was open about in his biography. Fashion also received abuse from those closer to him, especially his brother and fellow footballer John Fashion. John disowned Justin in the black newspaper The Voice. My gay brother, the outcast, read the headline. This reaction, not only from the black community he felt he represented, but also his family, devastated Justin. But he was gay. He couldn't accept, just could not accept that at all. As a family, the whole family, he was outcast. I remember I, I paid him a substantial amount of money to not come out and say he was gay. So uh, when he came out and said he was gay, that was a little bit too much. Did you find that hard? I found it impossible. And uh, unfortunately, he then decided that he couldn't go on. This abuse is not just an issue from years gone by, however. Everest spoke about some of his recent teammates' negative reactions to the idea of being teammates with a gay player. Some of my colleagues said, it is against my religion. If there is a homosexual in this locker room, let him leave the club. Who could blame homosexual players for keeping their sexuality a secret when football has shown at best apathy at accepting them and at worst pure hatred, both on and off the pitch. The second potential cause suggested by Ogawa's thesis of missing men, is the idea of non-participation. This scenario suggests that the lack of outwardly gay men is due to them being pushed away from taking part in sports during their upbringing, suggesting the masculine cultures surrounding sports in teenage years made them ultimately too uncomfortable to progress their athletic careers. Eric Anderson and John Zip both found data suggesting this is the cause, yet Ogawa points out the flaws in their data. Looking at the average dropout rates for boys playing sports is problematic because it assumes the decision to drop out is the same for boys of average ability 
as it is for boys of exceptional ability. Ogawa is suggesting that once a young man with the ability to be successful thinks he might have a chance to make it to the top levels of the sport, the pull of potential monetary earnings would give him a strong reason to stay in the sport. Men have hidden their sexualities in a hope to boost career prospects in all areas of work. For some, money, success and fame is more than enough to encourage a person to keep their sexuality a secret. The final hypothesis of Scott Ogawa is selection. This suggests that players who are gay are pushed out of participation by managers, coaches or teammates, not always necessarily due to homophobia, sometimes being how sexuality can affect the bodies and skills of people. Numerous studies, most notably Bogart and Blanchard's 1996 study, physical development and sexual orientation in men, height, weight and age of puberty differences. This study suggests that on average, homosexual men are smaller and lacking in muscle strength compared to heterosexual men. And regarding spatial awareness exercises, scored closer to women than heterosexual men. These studies are potentially extremely flawed and must be taken with a grain of salt. Each of these studies are open to a selection bias in their creation, with the biggest subject pool being Bogart and Blanchard's 636 men split evenly between gay and straight. The selection hypothesis definitely fits in with Justin Fashion's story. It was at Nottingham Forest under the aforementioned homophobe Brian Clough where he was dropped from the first team and was transferred out of the soonest opportunity. Fashnu came into the club as a known top class player with room to grow further. Although we can't know for certain the reasons for his fall from the first team, the lack of reasons given from Clough, together with the manager's evident homophobia, suggests that Fashnu's sexuality was at least partially a cause. Although Agawa's hypotheses offer several reasons for the lack of visible homosexuality in the beautiful game, what if we think about the sport in general? Is the issue with football itself? When we look at the women's game, it becomes clear this isn't a footballing issue. Right at the top, players of LGBTQ lifestyles are visible. Marta, a veteran Brazilian player, widely considered to be the best player of her generation, if not ever, is married to her teammate, Tony Presley. Megan Rapinoe, two-time World Cup winner and 2019's Player of the Year, has been publicly out since the early years of her career. And it's no different here in the UK either. There's quite a few openly gay football players, but I think we get quite a lot of openly gay uh, female fans as well. It's just seen as like, it's very inclusive. Aston Villa's Alicia Lehman, who previously dated her national teammate, Ramona Bachman, Noted, in women's football, it's perfectly normal for people to come out. It doesn't change anything. These women aren't unusual anomalies. In the 2019 Women's World Cup, 38 of the 552 players were openly queer, including an engaged couple who play for the US, and three of these queer women who play for the English national team. The representation doesn't just stop with homosexual players either. In recent years, a few high-profile trans athletes have publicly come out. Quinn, who won a bronze medal with Canada's women's team at the Tokyo Olympics, became the first trans athlete to do so after coming out as non-binary in 2020. You know, really frustrated with not being my authentic self. Inspired by Quinn's general acceptance, Kumi Yokoyama, a player for the Japanese women's national team, came out as transgender. In Kumi's case, his playing career is actually preventing him from completing his transition. And as such, he is planning on having these surgeries once he retires. So one thing is clear, women's football is more inclusive towards queer players. So why? In reality, the reasons are likely numerous. But one thing I'd like to discuss is the concept of othering. Pat Griffin, in her 2014 essay, Overcoming Sexism and Homophobia in Women's Sports, Two Steps Forward and One Step Back, brings up the point that historically the role of the athlete has been intrinsically linked culturally with masculinity. Women who operate in this culture of masculinity are othered by society, considered to be breaking away from the expected norms. As such, they know what it's like to not be heteronormative and potentially can relate and empathize more with their queer colleagues, creating a culture of acceptance within female athletes. 
So where does this leave homosexuality in men's football? And can queer visibility improve in the upcoming years? As it stands, there is only one openly gay footballer in any of the top professional leagues around the world. Hi everyone, it's Josh Cavalli here. I'm at my home here in Adelaide. There's something personal that I need to share with everyone. I'm a footballer and I'm gay. Josh Cavallo, a talented 22-year-old left-back for Adelaide United, came out in October 2021. Unlike previous gay players such as Fashion or Robbie Rogers, who came out of retirement after coming out as gay in order to play for LA Galaxy, Cavallo has the rest of his career to show how the current footballing cultural landscape will accept an openly out player. There was an initial outpouring of support for the Australian. Current ex-players and clubs all seem to line up to praise Josh as being brave enough to be open with his sexuality. We've been touched by what Josh Cavallo has said, that he went and told the world he was gay. For sure. Oh, I said to him, thank you. It's for me, something so normal and it's, it's not normalized at all in, in this industry. And it, it takes people like him that have the courage and they have the willingness to, to truly change the world. Edlene John, the FA's Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, spoke about how important it was for Cavallo to speak up. She said, We have to be honest and say there has been a historical context where it's been challenging for men in the professional game to come out. Adding, We're mindful that one of the key barriers that stops people from coming out is the fear of online abuse. Simone Pound from the Professional Footballers Association spoke to why a gay footballer shouldn't feel alone in the world of sports. I don't want to put too much pressure on anyone that they are going to come out and be the most influential role model. That narrative is also keeping people in the closet. We've got role models already. Starting with Justin Fashnu, all the players who have come out since and all the openly gay athletes around the world, the person who comes out and is playing in the Premier League will be joining a group of people. They will not be out there on their own. Yet even earlier this year, Cavallo has faced homophobic abuse from opposition fans while on the pitch, stating afterwards, this shouldn't be acceptable and we need to do more to hold these people accountable. Hate will never win. I will never apologize for living my truth and most recently, who I am outside of football. Will other top level players potentially follow in his footsteps? Or will the abuse Cavallo has faced keep those men silent or out of the game altogether? While I'm hopeful, only time will tell. As we've explored, the issue with homophobia in football isn't exclusive to the English game. Yet, as we can see from the women's side of the sport, football itself isn't to blame. It remains to be seen how the culture surrounding the men's game will evolve. The reputation that football has a lot of the times true and it's very toxic, it's a very toxic environment in a way of like how we have to be so mature and we have to look a certain way, we have to act a certain way, we have to just stick to, to football and um, you know we get put in a box and you cannot talk about politics, you cannot talk about anything and I think slowly, slowly a lot of players have been able to express what they really like and who they really are. It remains to be seen how the culture surrounding the men's game will evolve. There may not be exactly 62 missing men in English football, but having looked at the evidence, I feel confident enough to say there are a significant number of gay players active today. Will football become more welcoming of queer men, or will men continue to feel they have to hide their sexuality in an effort to find success, or at the very least, not end up? like Justin Fashioning.